Welcome back to the Diet Doctor Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Brett Scher. Today, we're talking about exercise. Now, we've already done one episode on exercise with Professor Stu Phillips from McMaster University talking about resistance training, building muscle, basically the importance of muscle. Today, we're going to take it to the next step. We're going to talk about interval training and aerobic training. Because when you think about exercise, or at least when I think about it, it's sort of a three-legged stool with the aerobic base, the interval training, and the strength training and muscle building. Of course, there's also uh, flexibility and movement, and that, that's important. But from, from a health standpoint, where they're talking about improving your weight, improving your blood sugar, improving your body composition, improving your blood pressure, improving your insulin resistance, all these really important concepts of healthy weight loss, that's where I really see exercise playing a role. And again, those three of the strength training, the resistance training, and the aerobic training. And, and it's that key of healthy weight loss because we've said it on Diet Doctor. You've heard it before. You can't outrun a bad diet. Exercise is not the primary mode of weight loss. But if you are following a good diet, if you are losing weight by other means, exercise can really help modulate what kind of weight loss you have because you want to have healthy weight loss. I can't say that enough times. And what is healthy weight loss? Healthy weight loss is losing fat mass, maintaining or building your lean mass, maintaining or improving your resting metabolic rate and improving all the markers of your metabolic health, which are frequently things like HDL and triglycerides and blood sugar and insulin and blood pressure and your waist circumference and more. But those are a number of the components of healthy weight loss. And so this is going to be an episode of how interval training and how aerobic training can fit in. Now, aerobic training has gone through sort of its cycles. It was like the king in the 70s and the 80s. Everybody was doing marathons. Everybody had to do their aerobic training. And then it seems like interval training came in to sort of say, okay, now interval training is the new thing. This is what we have to do to really maximize our health. And then strength training and resistance training came in. Well, so in this ep episode, we're going to hear from two experts. We'll start with Phil Maffetone on the aerobic training, and then we'll go to Martin Gabala to talk about the interval training. So let's get started. Let's hear from Phil Maffetone, who you can find at philmaffetone.com. Now, Phil has pretty diverse and extensive training background. He's been trained in human biology, in chiropractic research, uh, in applied kinesiology, in exercise physiology, and in Chinese medicine, and in physiotherapy. So he really has seen sort of the, the breadth of of um, health and training and and human performance, and he's been working as a performance coach um, and since the 1970s, uh, where he's really one of the pioneers of this aerobic training methods. And he's worked with uh, one of my idols, Mark Allen, who you know was a young triathlete in the in the 80s and 90s, and Mark Allen was the best ever. And his epic battles with Dave Scott were just the best. Um, and that's how Phil Maffetone sort of, I guess you could say, got his name or got or got um, initially well known because of his work with Mark Allen. But he went beyond that of working not just with athletes, but working with everyday people to help improve fitness, to help improve health. And he's got a very um, interesting um, take on the the intersection between nutrition and exercise, as you're going to hear uh, in this this part with Phil Maffetone. So let's see what Phil has to say. Well, Phil, you've been involved in this whole discussion of exercise since the 1970s, and you've probably seen the trends come and go from cardio to resistance training to interval training. But throughout the whole thing, you've sort of stayed steadfast as the voice of cardio, as the voice of the aerobic training. So, so give us sort of your overview of how you see aerobic training fitting into health and fitness for the average person or for the athlete that you work with. Well, it's a it's a good uh, point that that you know the the aerobic um, training, the aerobic focus that I've had has has sort of been steadfast uh, from the beginning because I was pretty convinced that this is. This is really important, and I, and it really wasn't until I got into the trenches, got into practice, uh, and and realized how much opposition there was to it, um, and uh, and and you know people slinging mud at me literally for quite a few years. But um, the the bottom line is that uh, the aerobic system, our aerobic system, we're all familiar with the nervous system, the digestive system, and all of these different 
important components of our physiological makeup. The aerobic system is such a valuable thing, not only for our health, but for our fitness, and not only for our fitness, but for our human performance, overall human performance, whether it's uh, corporate performance or uh, learning, uh, teaching, uh, being parents, and, and so on and so forth. But sports performance, uh, because in, in, in most cases, uh, the sports that most people are doing, certainly most amateurs, are endurance sports. And so whether you're running a 5K or walking it or a marathon, uh, your aerobic system is doing a lot of the work. And without a good uh, functioning, good healthy aerobic system, uh, we, we can't perform as well. And we, we risk hurting ourselves in the process. So would you say aerobic training, the sort, the sort of, you know, slow, steady distance, the 70% heart rate, the zone two, however it's defined, would you say that's more important than resistance training than interval training? Or do you say it's it's equally as important and just has to come in a different sequence? They're, they're equally important. We, we certainly want to um, stimulate our anaerobic system, which is our uh, power, fast twitch, uh, speed uh, system. However, don't don't be fooled by that word speed and the word slow you used um, or easy re regarding the aerobic system. Because as we build our aerobic system, uh, what we're doing is burning more and more fat for energy. And as we can do that, we get faster and faster. So one of the ways to get fast is to build our aerobic system. One of the ways to really put a, a, you know, tweak that speed is to do the high intensity uh, track workouts or whatever, whatever high intensity you enjoy doing. There's no magic bullet there. Um, uh, or race as a, as a workout. That's a, a good way to do it as well. But that aerobic system has to be built first. And if we try to build that aerobic system while we're adding or while we're incorporating or doing even unknown, uh, unknowingly um, anaerobic uh, training, higher stress, uh, higher intensity training, we can impair aerobic progress. And that's a big factor and, and has been for me from the beginning is you need this period of time. It's called an aerobic base. Um, that that phrase hasn't been used um, a whole lot lately, but it's called an aerobic base period where we build a solid foundation of uh, health and fitness, and the aerobic system will help do that. And is that an important concept, whether you're working with you know, the star athletes, Mark Allen from the 1980s and 90s, the probably greatest endurance athlete ever who you work so closely with. Is it the same as if you're working with Mark Allen as, you're, as if you're working with, with me, Brett Schur, the average guy just trying to be healthy? Like, does that concept of the aerobic base sort of hold steady in both it cases? It sure does. And, and um, I, I, do, uh, I do treat everyone the same on, uh, in a sense because my focus is uh, to personalize the process. I don't, I don't know what you need, but if I evaluate you, I'll have a pretty good idea of what you need personally uh, to do with your, with your training and with food as well. But uh, from a training standpoint, uh, just what you need is, is individual to you, and we have to figure that out. And everyone needs that good, solid foundation of aerobic function in order to start the process and and um, I mean, it's, 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 there's so many benefits to that. It's not just that we get more energy because we're burning more fat. It's not just that we uh, protect our uh, joints and muscles and bones from injury because we're building the aerobic muscle fibers, which are our long-term uh, functioning fibers. So all day long, we're walking around, sitting, we're we're training, we're doing all these things, and our aerobic muscles can tolerate that because they have endurance. And so uh, we're, 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 we're eliminating the risk, we're, we're reducing significantly the risk of injury when we have a good aerobic system. And that is so important. I think that deserves another minute here, the risk of injury, because 
the, the worst thing that can happen is someone decides to get healthy, decides to start an exercise program, gets injured, and then says, ah, I knew it was bad for me. Forget it. I give up. I'm never doing it again. Like that's the absolute worst thing that can happen. So I guess the practical take home is you don't go from the couch to the heavy lifting. You don't go from the couch to the sprint intervals. You go from the couch to the aerobic base. And then at some point you're you graduate to be able to do the higher intensity and the higher workload. Yep. I guess the question is, what's the time? What's the duration? You know, how do you know when you've reached that point? And I know there's not one answer, but what are sort of the general concepts that someone can think about to this is what I do when I get started and this is when I know I'm ready to sort of progress a little yeah, bit? Yeah, it, it, as you say, it depends on the person, but a, a, a person just getting off the couch and wanting to uh, work out, they want to get fit, um, in the back of their mind, which they haven't mentioned yet, is that they want to run a 5K because their friends are doing that, or a 10K, or a marathon. Um, no problem, but we have to start building that base, and that means starting aerobically at a relatively, for most people, they're going to start at a relatively slow pace. Um, and in many cases, they can't even run because their heart rate zooms up too high and that's a reflection of how well, uh, how fit you are aerobically. And if you're not very aerobically fit, you, you can't do much physical work without inducing stress. So we want to start really slow and typically walking, and then you walk faster, and then you start jogging over the weeks. And it could take three to six months to really build a good, solid aerobic system. And during that period, you, you get faster and faster at the same sub-max heart rate, at the same uh, so-called easy heart rate. And, um, and you're, you, you feel the same. In the beginning, you're walking slow, and you feel a certain way because you're at a certain heart rate. Well, that same heart rate, three, four, five, six months later, is now a, 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 an easy run. And um, it's a wonderful feeling, uh, and and people 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 love it. Yeah, I, I can I can attest to that. Actually, I, I followed a lot of your advice when I was training for an Ironman in the early '90s. And when I started, I thought I can't keep going this slow. I mean, my heart rate is telling me I have to slow down. It was almost like it was almost painful for me to go that slow because of my. Pre previous mindset. But a few months later, all of a sudden, I wasn't thinking that anymore because I had gotten faster at that same heart rate. Now, that's one thing to say when you're competing and, and training and doing it on a regular basis. But the same thing, like you're saying, holds true for the average person, that they will be able to do more, a longer walk, a faster walk, a jog at that previous heart rate um, when they stick to this type of training. Now, you call it I, I guess I, you call it the the math method or the the mathetone method, or they're different names, I guess. But also, people say zone two training. People say aerobic. What do you think of the terminology? Like, what do you call it, and how how can someone define when they're at that level? Yeah, the terminology has been interesting for me to watch from from w way back from when I was a student. You know, you had the 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 physiology instructors um, having their terminology, the textbooks have their terminology, and you get out into the trenches and you talk to coaches, you talk to, to runners and cyclists, and, they, and you know, the, the, the social scene has all of its terminology from cardio and, the, I mean, I, I've heard it all. Um, but it's, it's, um, it, it's, it's, I, I refer to it as maximum aerobic function. MAF means maximum aerobic function. And what we're trying to do is maximize this aerobic system through training. And we, we do that initially, like we talked about, by training at a, at a, a, sl a slower, usually a slower pace, an easier pace. And then as we get, as we get um, that aerobic system burning more fat and the muscles develop and we start circulating blood better and our, our health improves, all those things. Gradually, we could do more and more, uh, more and more work, but it's, it's, it's all about the aerobic system. And I know they've talked about these different zones. Um, that was like years later uh, and I haven't kept up with them. So don't ask me any questions about them because I just call it the, <laughs> the MAF heart rate. That's your, 
That's your min, that's your max aerobic heart rate that you can train at. You don't want to exceed that. And you want to warm up in, in the first about 12 to 15 minutes leading up to that heart rate. And then you want to cool down. So you're really going through all of the heart rate ranges uh, up to your max, your submax, uh, that MAF uh, heart rate uh, from beginning to the end of the workout. And then when we do anaerobic training, we, we expand that to go, to go higher. But the, the, the ranges of heart rate that you go through start at resting and it slowly creeps up to that MAF heart rate and then it slowly creeps down to, to cool down. And that's the whole workout. And, a lot of, and there's a lot of um, uh, discipline required to do that um, because... Uh, we're in a society where it's no pain, no gain. You go out the door, you think, well, gee, I, I don't have a lot of time and I'm going to get these five miles in uh, and, you know, get back and go to work because I, you know, it, it doesn't matter how far you go. What matters is how many minutes you run. And if you only have 20 minutes, that's a great starting point. If you have 30 minutes, fine, work your way up and uh, if you only have 20 minutes in the morning and you have 20 minutes in the afternoon, that's 40 minutes of aerobic exercise. That's that's a pretty good um, day's work. Yeah, I think you hit on a critical concept there, and that's and that's time because so many people feel pressed for time. So they they may read the official recommendations of a, you know 150 minutes per week of moderate activity. And just think 150 minutes, who's got that? I mean, it boils down to 30 minutes, five days a week, but even that may, may seem too much for people. And that's of course the allure of this sprint interval training, the high intensity interval training that you can get it in shorter durations. But now you're saying even just 20 minutes, get out, do something. I mean, is there sort of a minimum threshold that you think people need to accomplish to get the benefits of this type of aerobic training? Well, first of all, people need to be physically active. So if you're sitting at a desk all day, it, it doesn't matter if you run seven miles in the morning you go to work and you sit at a desk all day, you're, you're basically an inactive person. And so the, 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 the illusion is that you're a runner and you run every day, and, but you sit at your, your desk all day. You come home and you sit on the couch and what, you know, we need to increase our physical activity. That means getting up and moving and doing different things. Uh, but from an exercise standpoint, um, we really don't need that much exercise to to uh, increase our fitness. If you want to talk about performance and you want to run that 5K and your goal is to, you know, run a faster 5K and then your goal is to run a 10K or a half marathon, um, that's a whole different thing. You need, to, you need to take your whole life and say, okay, here's my whole life. I've got uh, work, I've got family, I've got these social obligations and taking care of a house, uh, where am I going to put all that training? And if you don't have time for it, uh, you need to do some soul searching. Um, you, you've got to have time for physical activity. Um, that's, a, that's a requirement we all have as humans. And, um, uh, but but you know, don't, don't, don't cut an hour of sleep out of your schedule because you, you, know, you want to train. That, that can backfire. Yeah, that's a great point. That's a great point. Now, I want to circle back to earlier, you talked about fat burning. Um, and, you know, there's this concept of you can't outrun a bad diet, that exercise is not the primary mode of weight loss. Um, but yet you talk about being in the fat burning zone. So give me your thoughts about exercise, how it relates to weight loss and specifically fat mass, fat mass loss. Well, I, what I... What the aerobic system does is it burns a lot of fat, stored body fat, for energy. We, we take this fat, we convert it to energy, and now the aerobic muscles have a, a good amount of energy. We have, we have a whole, even the leanest of us has a lot of energy, hundreds of miles of uh, activity that we can do in, in, in one workout. That's how much body fat a lean person has. And so what we want to do and what the purpose of building the aerobic system is, uh, is metabolically to, to generate that aerobic energy, get that aerobic engine working 
better and better so that we can burn more and more fat. And when we burn more and more fat, we not only burn it during the warm up and during the aerobic workout, and of course the cool down, but we we can burn it all day long as well. So it's not so much the calories we burn during a workout, it's which calories are we burning and how long can we burn those calories for? In the case of fat, when we develop the aerobic system, we burn that fat all day long. So we don't fall asleep at our desk. We don't get um, sleepy, mm-hmm. tired by 6.30, 7 in the evening. Um, we, have, we have a lot of energy. Um, and that's what the aerobic system does. We, w- the, the phrase, we can't run away from a bad diet, means um, that that whole thing has a caveat, which is if we eat, if we eat junk food, it isn't going to work. The, the, the aero- as much discipline as you have building that aerobic system, following your heart rate, monitoring your, your, um, your warm-up and cool-down and, and choosing the right uh, max aerobic heart rate, um, none of it's going to really matter. You're not going to, I wouldn't say you're not going to get anywhere because you're circulating the blood and you're, you know, you're feeling good about the fact that you're working out. But uh, in terms of aerobic function, it just won't, it just won't go anywhere compared to when uh, you're eating the right foods and avoiding the, the wrong foods. Yeah, and you've always been a big proponent about that intersection of of aerobic training and nutrition. And actually, and I want to get into more about that in a minute. But it actually makes me wonder: all these studies that are done comparing, you know, interval training versus aerobic training versus resistance training that don't control for the diet at all. Um, that really is a weakness to a it's lot a, of those it's studies. It's a huge um, weakness. That's yeah. so much of a weakness. And I've always wanted to do a study on on that. And and it wouldn't be hard to do to 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 say, hey, look at all these hundred thousands of studies, in fact, um, that didn't uh, consider what the person was eating or in particular didn't consider whether they were insulin resistant or how insulin resistant were they um, and or how much fat were they burning, how, you know, what was their balance of fat and sugar uh, all those things, mm-hmm. very, very important, uh, and we can't ignore them. And that's why a lot of this, you know, the studies on uh, how much exercise you need can be very deceptive because it doesn't account not only for diet, but it doesn't account for our natural, normal physical activity in, in the course of a day. Is this, is this group a, a sedentary group where they sit a, at an office desk all day long, even though they're running in the morning, right. or are they physically up and down all day and moving and doing different things and, and, and so forth. So yeah, that, that dietary effect, you can't do an exercise study without considering um, food. Yeah, that's a good point. And, and while we're still on this concept of burning fat though, you know, I guess the, the knock against aerobic training is that you're burning a higher percentage of fat, but if you do higher intensity work like interval training, your total calories burned is more at least per unit time. So even if the percentage of fat is lower, the total amount of fat can be equal or more. So not, uh, not, uh, hopefully I explained yeah, you that did. correctly. Not, but, and and yeah. not necessarily because uh, we know, for example, that people who are uh, carbohydrate intolerant, insulin resistant, um, don't burn a lot of fat. Uh, and if they don't burn a lot of fat at rest, uh, they're not going to burn a lot of fat on the treadmill when they're measured, and they're not going to burn a lot of a fat. Uh, uh, they're not going to burn a lot of fat at all those levels of intensity going up to max. Uh, the fact is, though, when you have a good aerobic system, you do burn a lot of fat at rest, and then when you're being aerobic, and then at your high intensities, when you max out, you're you're still burning a a surprisingly high amount of fat. It may only be 30% of your energy, but that's a lot of fat at a high intensity level. So, um, and and I I know you can play with the numbers and I know people have uh, used that to say, well, you know, you still burn fat. uh, You still burn as much fat if you have a high intensity workout. It's just not true because they don't account for the person's uh, tolerance to to carbohydrates because a lot of those people don't burn much fat to begin with. All right. So while we're discussing burning fat and 
how different people burn fat at different rates while exercising, it makes sense that you would want your body to be as efficient at burning fat as possible to get the maximum benefit from exercise. So my leading question and kind of unfair question then is, does everybody need to be in ketosis and eat a ketogenic diet to maximize their fat burning with aerobic training? Not necessarily, but really what it comes down to, I say it's not necessarily the case, um, but in many cases it is because so many people today are um, carbohydrate intolerant. They're insulin resistant. First of all, nobody should eat junk food. All refined carbohydrates should be eliminated from the diet. There's no, I mean, the, the only scientists that would not agree with that are the ones that work for the big food companies. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, nobody should eat junk food. Uh, no, not even a little bit. Uh, you can't take a little bit of heroin on the weekend because it's fun. Uh, it doesn't, that, that, that's not what moderation really is. Um, the question is how much natural carbohydrate can we eat? Fruits and vegetables and uh, lentils and um, whatever, natural unprocessed carbohydrates. And that really depends on your level of carbohydrate intolerance. And I, I developed a, um, uh, an evaluation that people can do on their own called the two-week test. And that enables people to uh, go very low on carbohydrate for this two-week period to see how they feel. To, they, they, first, they make a list of all their signs and symptoms, um, uh, regardless of what they may be related to. And then they do two weeks of very low carbohydrate, high fat, moderate protein, and they see what, um, what happens to those signs and symptoms. If they feel a, a whole lot better after two weeks, they know they were carbohydrate intolerant. Uh, and then they, yeah. they, they go from there. And, and if you really want to know if your body fat's too high, you don't have to get a DEXA scan. If you're, if you're really serious and, uh, and you're part of a study, maybe that's what they'll do. But I don't recommend a DEXA scan. I recommend the, the waist to height ratio because it's almost as accurate. Some say it's the same accuracy. Um, you measure your waist at the level of the belly button and you measure your height. Don't assume your height is the same as your license because <laughs> um, it, it probably isn't. And, and then you should be, your waist should be less than half your height. And if, if it's not, then you're over fat. You'd be considered over fat. You have too much body fat. Too much body fat is very dangerous. Um, among the things that it does is it um, promotes uh, body-wide chronic inflammation, uh, which is a very dangerous situation. But what it means in particular is that you're insulin resistant. You're carbohydrate intolerant. You cannot yeah. eat even relatively small amounts of um, natural carbohydrate without producing too much, too much insulin or uh, without um, inducing stress. Right, and I think, I think a real important take home from your message that you've said earlier is if you are insulin resistant and you are doing the aerobic training, you're not going to get near the benefit as if you were not insulin resistant because that's gonna really affect um, your fat burning. You know, when you do these max VO2 tests or these exercise cardiometabolic tests, your respiratory quotient, um, how much carbs versus fat you're burning changes with intensity of exercise. But what, again, what is not talked about enough is what you've been eating leading up to and what your metabolic health coming into the test really affects it, yep. which kind of is a, is a good transition then to talk about this article you wrote back in 2016, athletes fit, but unhealthy that was published in Sports Medicine, where you, you did a really good job of, of showing this graph or this diagram of the intersection between overtraining, you know, just training too hard, not sleeping enough, not recovering enough, and f feeling all the negative symptoms that come with that, but also how that's then tied in with nutrition. And that's the part that I hadn't really heard talked about very much, that it's the, the high glycemic, high carb nutrition that doesn't just contribute potentially to metabolic disease, but also contributes to overtraining, which was interesting. And also this concept that, you know, look, I'm an athlete, I'm putting in all the miles, I'm doing all the training so I can eat whatever I want. And 
I was guilty of that. I was drinking the, the, you know, the goos and the sugary drinks and the, the electrolyte replacement that I needed that was full of sugar and loading up with carbs. Cause that's what you were supposed to do. Now, fortunately I sort of reversed course before it was too late, but we see countless examples of elite athletes who didn't reverse course until they had a diagnosis of metabolic syndrome or type two diabetes or whatever. So this is sort of this emerging field. So, so give us your, your impression on this intersection between food training and unhealthy athletes. Wow. There's, there's a lot of places to go. And one of the, the most unfortunate examples is the person who dies partway through a marathon or in the swim of a triathlon. We heard about one just the other day, actually. Um, in, in Florida, um, mm. uh, 50, I, I think a 50 year old or early fifties, uh, uh, you know, it, it's a preventable problem. Um, and, and, and it's very sad that these things just have been ongoing for many, many years. Uh, we, 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 we have to stop and say, well, this no pain, no gain thing hasn't been working. This junk food sports diet hasn't been working. What are we going to do about it? And, you know, a lot of these cases and, and a lot of people who aren't sure what's going on, they could be evaluated. They can be tested. We know, uh, we know the, the, the signs. We know the risk factors. Uh, they're often um, not, not evaluated. So uh, many people don't know that they're a ticking time bomb. But, you know, it's not much different. It's more intense and more serious, but it's not much different than uh, a knee injury. You, you train and then your knee blows out and you have this knee injury. Well, that's also a preventable thing. And if it happens to be your knee, that's not so bad. If it happens to be your heart, it's a problem, obviously. But these are injuries associated with overtraining. But if the diet allowed us to overtrain because the diet didn't let us burn the fats, didn't let us build our, our aerobic system to protect us, to circulate blood properly and all that stuff, uh, then the diet plays a, a significant role in the process as well. Yeah. So I think a big, a couple of things about what you mentioned that people don't get evaluated because a lot of times there is this like aura of health around them. You know, you're an athlete, you're training, you're putting the time in you must be healthy. So uh, either I don't need to go to the doctor or the doctor says, oh, you're fine. You're running, you know, five miles a day. You know, you're great. And the evaluation doesn't go much further. So I think that's one problem that we just have to get over that sort of automatic halo of exercise equals health. Um, but the other thing, this concept that we need to fuel our bodies, we constantly need to fuel our bodies. You know, it starts with the kids, you know, playing 20 minutes of soccer and then they need their snack and their Gatorade or whatever for their 20 minute soccer game. Yep. But it also translates to, to grownups. You, you go for your 45 minutes on the treadmill, then you need to replenish with a sports drink and a carbohydrate. Like how do you get that message to people that no, actually you will be fine without that, especially if you train your body over time to burn fat for fuel. So wh what's that message? Yeah, that's a, that's a tough a message to get across to people because the other message they're getting, which is you need to drink this junk, is coming from uh, companies that are spending billions of dollars to tell people that, and they do it much better than we can. We're just giving them the facts. They're giving them the, the sizzle, and the sizzle is, is much more important than the facts. And uh, when you have... Uh, you know, when you're, when you're showing the Olympics and the, the marathon is being run and then it goes to a commercial and you get people guzzling down, you know, that image stays with you. And that has been uh, what's been ongoing since the 50s. Uh, and, you know, we need the more carbs you can get in, the better and all, because you need glycogen stores and it's such a farce. It's just such a farce. And yeah. I, I don't know, this is a public health problem and uh, public health really doesn't want to address it. Governments don't really want to address it. They're, they're ignoring it. Um, they're being lobbied by the same companies that are telling people to guzzle down the, the, the junk food drinks and eat the, the garbage, uh, you know, the so-called energy bars, which zap your energy, actually. Right. Um, 
And so it, and it really is sort of a circular problem because if they're being told they need these and then they're taking the carbs, they're taking all the, all the junk in the energy bars and they're fueling their insulin resistance, then they do become more dependent on it because the more insulin resistant you are, as soon as you burn through your glycogen, you, you hit the wall and you don't have that energy anymore. So that's a big reason for burning more fat because it, it conserves our glycogen stores. And if we're in a marathon and we're using a lot of fat, we're not using up our glycogen stores. We're, we're conserving that glycogen until the last mile or two or three, the last 5K, when we're going to really kick that, the, those last you know, three miles uh, or, or mile or two. Uh, and we're going to use up our glycogen stores at that point. But by now, the race is mostly done and we've, we've used fat to get to that, to that point already. Yeah. So I think one practical take home thing though, is that you can't again, go from the couch to the two hour workout with, you know, burning your fat stores. It doesn't work that fast. You have to work up to that. And that's a big part about your aerobic training, building that aerobic base that it does take time. But if you believe in the method, you believe in the process and you stick with it, you're going to get there. It's just not going to happen overnight. I think that's an important take home. It's, it's very important. And, and what's even more important is to understand that it's not going to take you a long time. If you're eating well, you're already on your road to being more fit. If you're eating well, your first workout, 20 minute walk is going to give you huge benefits. Don't, don't, don't be misled into thinking it's this is the old um, you know weight loss thing well it's going to take me weeks and months and it's not you you know when if you start eating right today um, by this evening you're going to be burning more fat by morning you're going to be burning more fat if you go for a walk in the morning now you're really way down the road from where you are at this moment and so uh, the sooner you start the better yeah and that's interesting because people, a lot of times like metrics. What can I follow? What can I measure? How do I know it's working? And the scale is unfortunately the most common metric. But what you're saying has nothing to do with what you can see or measure except in a, you know, a, a hot cardiometabolic lab, which people aren't going to have access to. So you really have to believe the process, don't you? You do. And there's two very important, simple tests. Uh, the scale is, is worthless. I recommend people get rid of the scale because uh, you're just measuring water weight, and you could you could um, uh, you could start exercising, and uh, after a month or two, don't feel any different. You're really exhausted, and you find out you've gained eight pounds. Um, no surprise, I've seen that a lot. Uh, what you want to measure is how much faster you can go at the same heart rate. Let's say 140 is your max aerobic heart rate that you determine. There's something called the 180 formula. You could plug yourself into that and get your individualized max aerobic heart rate. Uh, at 140 today, all you could do is walk at a moderate pace. And in a month, at a 140 heart rate, if you're eating well, uh, you, you, may be, you may be able to walk at a very fast pace or maybe even jog at 140 heart rate. A month later, now you're jogging at a 930 pace or whatever. Um, that's one thing. The other is that waist to height ratio. Measure your waist. You only have to measure your height once. Uh, here's a hint. If you do it in the morning, you'll be a little taller, most people. Uh, but measure your height, measure your waist. And then every month or so, measure your waist again, because now you've got a good foundation of what that waist is. And as you burn more body fat, you'll see that waist size get smaller and smaller. That yeah. don't, it doesn't matter what the scale says. The scale uh, can be quite misleading and um, depressing, to say the least. Well, I think that was a great overview about the benefits of aerobic training, practical tips of how to do it, and the intersection with nutrition. But now I understand you've got some interesting research that's come out recently or coming out soon. So I'd like to hear about what, what you have on tap for, for research interests and papers coming out. Sure, the research is sort of ongoing, um, and it's, uh, you know, in recent years, um, not being in practice anymore, I have more time to do uh, research, um, which, is, which is a lot of fun, but it's sort of a, a, a takeover from where the clinical observations were made. Um, uh, I, I knew, for example, that people who um, were eating better were on a lower carbohydrate, higher fat diet, 
would uh, perform better than people who were uh, training the same but eating um, not as well. So now we're, we're seeing that that actually does work out in, in the laboratory. We, we can burn more fat. Uh, not only can we burn more fat, but we can um, look at the markers of cardiovascular risk, for example, uh, or, or diabetes. We can look at these risk factors and say, well, the high fat diet's supposed to make all those things worse. Actually, it doesn't. It makes them better. And it helps, uh, it, it helps um, burn more fat. And it doesn't interfere with performance. We can perform just as well without the carbohydrates. So there's a lot of myths that we're trying to bust uh, on, a, on a scientific level. And uh, getting those papers published um, is just, it's a lot of fun to see. Very good. Well, I look forward to more research coming out because I do think that that intersection of of dietary quality and training methods um, is really going to elevate the the health research in general and certainly the exercise research when you combine it with with nutrition. So thanks for being an advocate for that and and not just on the clinical side but on the research side as well. I think that's so important. It is. Next, let's hear from Martin Gabala. Now, Martin is a PhD in kinesiology and a professor at McMaster University in the Department of Kinesiology. He's also the author of the book called The One-Minute Workout. We started with maybe the seven-minute workout, the six-minute workout. He brought it down to the one-minute workout. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, you can find him on Twitter at Gabala, G-I-B-A-L-A-M, and then martingabala.com as well. He's a big proponent of high-intensity interval training and what he calls exercise snacks. And we're going to hear a lot about the practical aspects of, of interval training, what it even means to be interval training, how people can incorporate that into their uh, lives, and the, the good and the bad of interval training. So let's hear what Martin has to say. Well, Martin, you've obviously had a very big hand on a lot of the research when it comes to high-intensity interval training. So give us a background of how you see um, high intensity interval training and how it fits into the overall atmosphere in general of exercise and for health and for fitness and what role does it play do you think it's a tool right and so in a lot of ways we rediscover interval training every decade or so at least scientifically <laughs> and of course you know the more i'm in this field the more i appreciate the athletic as well as the scientific history of interval training you know athletes have been using it as a tool to help them win gold medals since the turn of the century and, you know, I, now, I, I think now there's certainly widespread interest in the term interval training. I think people use hit as sort of a, uh, as a catch-all phrase, but to me, hit is just one element or, or one aspect of, of interval training. You know, I think uh, just like it serves as a tool for athletes, it can serve as a tool for uh, everyday individuals to boost their fitness. I'm a proponent. I think it has some, certainly some efficiency advantages, if I can use that term. But increasingly, I see these very polarized debates. You're either for hit or you're against it, or you know, people either demonizing hit or demonizing traditional cardio. And I, I just don't have a lot of time for those debates because it's it's not about which is necessarily better. It's it's what's you know for those who are interested in using this tool. I think they can use it effectively, and I'm sure we'll get into some tips for how to potentially do that. Yeah, but that's it's a great point because you talk about you know demonizing cardio or resistance training or hit, you know the different types, and um, for those who are interested in doing it, they can do it. But why should somebody be interested in it? I think that that's the main thing. Like if someone's looking to lose weight, improve their health, improve their metabolic health, improve their blood sugar, their blood pressure. Uh, feel better about themselves. What do you see as the niche there for for hit? And then after that, we'll talk about the specific different types of hit. Sure, a couple of things. Uh, I, I think clearly, when when I say efficiency, there's definitely a time efficiency to interval training. And to me, there is this intensity duration trade off. And intensity the the higher the intensity, so the 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 harder you're willing and able to work, the less time that's required to see some benefits. And so at least for some individuals, you know, now if you're an athlete, you want to optimize performance. HIT is essential in order to allow you to do that. And any serious endurance athlete is usually utilizing HIT as a tool to optimize their performance. For more everyday individuals, if I can use that term, 
there's a, a an efficiency there. And so, for example, we've shown, others have shown, you can get the benefits in terms of boosting your cardiorespiratory fitness with a 20-minute bout of HIT that's similar to a 50-minute bout of more traditional endurance training. If you want to do the traditional endurance training, that's fine, but you can get there faster with intervals. And the other point is if you want to optimize your fitness, even if you're just the everyday person, I think you want to incorporate, you got to push it once in a while in order to optimize your fitness level. Yeah. And that, that, I think those are great points, but then the question becomes, what does it mean to push it? Is there some threshold that you have to reach? Because I mean, let's be honest, the, the average person who goes for a walk, um, or does, you know, elliptical or something, they might not have that feeling or that understanding of what type of effort it takes to be considered hit high intensity to get that added benefit. So how do you, how do you explain that to people? Sure. So let's even start with that catch-all term that I used, interval training, which is really just intermittent exercise. So alternating periods of higher intensity effort and lower intensity effort. Now, at the low end of the scale, or I will think of green, yellow, and red zones of interval training. So green is something as simple as interval walking. You know, your, your only exercises or activities walking around the block at night, picking up a pace for a few light posts, and then backing off. Just light, moderate, alternating periods of exercise. And we know from randomized clinical trials that that can actually be a better approach for you at improving your blood sugar, improving your fitness, even at uh, you know changing body composition as compared to just steady state, moderate intensity walking. And for a lot of people, that doesn't count as interval training. They don't think that. You know, a lot of, many individuals still think as HIT is this all out as hard as you can go gut busting type exercise. And that's only one flavor the, the yellow zone to me is classic high intensity interval training. And so the intensity there is above about 80% of maximal heart rate. I think there's growing consensus around that, but it's still submaximal in nature. You're not sprinting all out and it would be below your VO2 max pace. So that's sort of that middle yellow zone. And then the red zone is all out as hard as you can go, super maximal type exercise. And when we say super maximal, it's usually above VO2 max pace. And all of those approaches have been shown to be beneficial in certain individuals. Now, if you're the elite athlete, you're not going to use the green zone. It's not going to help you. But if you're the diabetic who's just starting out getting into exercise, you can adopt an interval training strategy but it's not up in the red zone. It's down in that yeah. green zone. And I think that's certainly one of the things that I appreciate interval training is it's broad, the many different types. We talk about expanding the movement menu, providing people with more options that are grounded in good science. There's only so many ways to jump on a treadmill and jog for 45 minutes at a moderate pace, but interval training, I think really opens up and prevents uh, presents a lot of possibilities. Yeah. So you, you already mentioned blood sugar control for people with type two diabetes. Now, why does shorter bouts of high intensity interval training improve blood sugar, um, the same or better than longer bouts of moderate exercise? Yeah. And, and you touched on something and I hope we come back to that, this idea of the same or better, because it really depends on how you make the comparison. And perhaps we can get into that in terms of why it's effective. Point one is this is why I still continue to be an active researcher in this area, because I think there's a lot of unanswered questions, but I'm a skeletal muscle physiologist. I'm primarily interested in what are the molecular signals that are changed by exercise and other stimuli that cause skeletal muscle remodeling that are then linked to improved health. And what we've shown in the lab and others have shown is that with these short, hard bursts of exercise, you can get the same cellular remodeling as you would expect with much longer periods of more traditional exercise. And so again, getting back to this efficiency idea, you can think of there's components of our muscle that are like molecular fuel gauges. So they sense when they sense a stress on the body and they respond and get better. They grow more mitochondria. And we know that one aspect of insulin sensitivity is linked to your mitochondrial content. So if you grow more mitochondria, you enhance the metabolic capacity of skeletal muscle, that's gonna be associated with better blood sugar control. Whether it's a direct link or whether it's an indirect link, 
that, you know, we could have a whole discussion about that. Point being more mitochondria is good for your muscle health, which is in turn good for your overall health. And again, you can grow these mitochondria faster with these short, hard bursts of exercise. Yeah. Yeah. That is interesting. So when you, when we talk about like how much exercise somebody should get, right, you go to the American college of sports medicine recommendations or the general recommendations, 150 minutes a week of moderate or 75 minutes a week of higher intensity. But what seems like what you've promoted in your, you know, one minute workout book and in, in some of your studies seems like 75 might even be too much. So do you have like this minimum threshold? You know, the recommendations are recommendations, right? They're not for everybody. They're for the general population. But I think most people want to know is what, what amount do I need to do to get that benefit? Do, so do you have numbers in your head that, that help people answer that question? The, the old, you know, how, how, how little can I get away with? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if five minutes good, nobody's doing six minutes, right? <laughs> exactly. And, so, you know, I would like to think that, and so first of all, look, the guidelines are based on very good science. I'm not here at all to take shots of the guidelines. And I also understand why the guidelines evolve slowly. So some recent guidelines, including in the UK, have been more explicit in suggesting that higher intensity interval type training may be a beneficial strategy that you can utilize. The physical activity guidelines for Americans, the most recent updated guidelines, did not go to that step. But they did remove the previous requirement that physical activity had to last 10 minutes in duration in order to be beneficial. And I think that was at least partly a recognition of, first of all, there was never really good scientific rationale for that suggestion, but I think it was at least a nod to the emerging science around shorter bursts of exercise can be beneficial, even if it's only a minute, every little bit counts. To, to go to your question, I, I, I think you, know, you, you need to be active, first of all, as much as possible, but if you really push me on the minimum, I would say, well, it can be as little as a minute a day, but that would be broken up into these short, hard bursts of 20 seconds at a time, right? So I'm still going to lean on the science, and I could at least point to science from our laboratory and some other laboratories that when people did these exercise snacks, these 20-second bursts of stair climbing three times a day, they did that three times a week for a couple of weeks, their fitness got a boost. You know, that's not to suggest that's going to induce all of the benefits of following the physical activity guidelines, but I would say a, a minute spread throughout the day if really, really pushed, but I'm not rec recommending that minimum level of exercise for anyone. Yeah. So for that level though, for that, like the studies you did on the three, um, was it the three 20 second sprint intervals separated by two minutes of, of active recovery? I mean, is that sort of all out sprint interval training in order to see those benefits? That's not just green zone. That's like red zone. Yeah. And we're talking, um, so, so two points there. The first is, you know, some of these studies, you're right. We've done three 20 second all out bursts as hard as you can go, you know, sprint from danger pace, pace you would run at to save your child from an oncoming car as hard as you can go. Um, we've used those protocols in some of our studies. The more recent snacking work has been yellow zone. And so we have encouraged people to use a challenging pace or vigorous exercise. And to go to you know an earlier question of how to gauge that, we'll often just use a zero to 10 scale. So rating of perceived exertion scale, we will allow the individual to self-select their own challenging or vigorous pace, but we'll try to guide them a little bit and say, this might be a seven on a 10 scale. So by no means do you have to sprint up those stairs like you're trying to escape from a fire, but you can't just use a pedestrian pace either. And so it, it really goes to this idea of, I think, framing interval training for different groups of individuals. You know, if I'm working with a high level athlete and I just say, oh, I'll go push it a little bit, that's not going to be enough prescription for them. But for the average person who's just trying to know, we might use get out of your comfort zone. Whatever your comfort zone is yeah. right now, get out of that by at least a one out of 10. You know, move yeah. one up higher on the scale, and that's sufficient for them to know, okay, I'm working a little harder right now. Yeah. And I, that's part that I find so interesting because one of the, I think one of the draws to the treadmill, the, you know, 
moderate cardio is it's not that uncomfortable. You, like you can do that for a long time and you're not uncomfortable because people don't always like to be uncomfortable, especially if you don't have a history of competing in athletics or training for anything. And now all of a sudden someone's asking you to push it it doesn't feel good for a lot of people. So you really have to sort of regulate that to some degree. So it sounds like your approach is sort of baby steps to, to keep pushing that a little bit more and start with just a little bit outside your comfort zone. Is that an accurate assessment? No, that's uh, that's fair. Um, and I also, you know, one of the things that I've learned in, in studying this for 15, almost 20 years now is I'm a physiologist. The way that I would present the research now or try to extrapolate it is a little bit different from 15 years ago. And there's been a lot of really good behavioral research. And, you know, I'm not a behavioral researcher, but I think you can largely uh, group it into two camps. <laughs> you know, the, there are individuals that say, you know what? We have evidence to suggest that actually some people like and enjoy this type of training better. They're willing to get uncomfortable for short periods of time if they know they get a break in between or they don't have to do as much of the more traditional approach. There's another group or camp, I would call it, that would suggest anything above the lactate threshold no one is ever going to do. And so interval training as a public health strategy is a complete waste of time. Clearly, I'm not in that camp. but there's sort of two schools of thought. And at the end of the day, scientifically, we're all reading the same papers. We're all trying to digest this information and we're gonna come to different perspectives. Some perhaps what I would use, you know, a more, um, I don't wanna use political terms, but you know, some are more conservative in their views, some are a little bit more liberal, you know, and we see this, for example, in cardiac rehab guidelines. Some countries, Norway, for example, very much a leader in adopting interval training strategies from a cardiac rehab perspective. Other groups, other areas, other countries, a little more conservative, you know, ostensibly, we all have the same goal to help people with physical activity and exercise, but people can have different perspectives and, and that's fair enough. Yeah. yeah. And, and so when we talk about people doing it though, like if they're not going to start, they're not going to is they're not going to do it. But if they start and they get injured or they don't feel good for some reason, they're not going to do it either. So, and there was actually an, uh, an article called, um, uh, published in Trends of, in Endocrinology and Metabolism is hit harmful to health. And I think part of that concern is injury. And part of that concern is like overtraining and doing too much. Um, so what kind of advice do you give to sort of prevent that from people going too far. Like if a little bit is good, then more is better. Like that concept. Yeah. So uh, two aspects there, I guess one from the injury perspective, I think it really depends on the type of exercise you're doing. You can exercise very vigorously on a bike or on an elliptical or in a swimming pool with very little impact and very low joint stress, right? So just because something's high intensity doesn't mean it's necessarily potentially more injurious from a musculoskeletal perspective. Clearly, sprint running, much, much higher joint impact forces, much, much greater eccentric loading, potential for soreness and, uh, and, and injury. So uh, again, it really depends on the type of interval training. In terms of the, the paper that you alluded to there, almost any type of exercise, if you do too much of it or too intensely, um, can induce some cellular disruption. And so I think it's gauging the amount of cellular disruption. You know, why we get better is our bodies, we induce these micro traumas with exercise, the body adapts and gets better. But if we induce too much disruption at a given time, that may set us back. And so some of these studies have shown, yes, acutely, you can have mitochondrial dysfunction. You can acutely make mitochondria worse with very intense vigorous exercise. And so I think the message there, getting back to our points earlier is, yeah, you, you wanna be smart. You know, you don't wanna go zero to a hundred, especially if you're starting out, you wanna take it to the next level and then continue to build from there. Almost sort of classic periodization that athletes uh, in, incorporate, you know, late in the season, the way they're training is not like at the start of their season. Yeah, that, that I love that analogy because when you don't have a season, it's sort of like everything's the same but maybe everybody should have some sort of a season to, to sort of period, peri I can't even say the word, but change up their, change up their training according to the time. I, th I think that's a really interesting concept, um, which most people don't do. Um, but let, let me ask you just a point blank question now. 
Will interval training help you lose weight? It's a tool that can. And so what I mean by that is personal trainers will talk about the afterburn effect. You know, if you ramp up the intensity, you burn more calories, you can go online and see these tremendous graphs showing huge afterburn effects after hit and very small effects after moderate training. The afterburn effect is real, but it's often overstated. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to be careful there and where there is pushback legitimately against interval training is where we overstate things. And so by just suggesting to people, by doing HIT, you're gonna magically see the pounds melt away. The evidence just does not support that. Again, with this idea of efficiency, you can burn a set amount of calories faster with intervals when you push the pace. You know, we've measured this afterburn effect in our laboratory and it's slightly greater and lasts for a longer period of time after exercise that's more intense than less intense. And so doing that repeatedly, those slight differences add up over time. And so you can see greater weight loss, greater body composition changes when you're comparing interval versus the traditional approach. But again, I think the key is that we don't overstate it. And almost any type of exercise, it's going to be the minor player. Com yeah. Diet, of course, but I think where you get the benefit for mineral training is this boost in fitness. So again, it can be, it's a tool, it's an efficient tool, but we need to not overstate the potential benefits. That's a great answer. And what about this concept of fat burning though, that when you're doing interval training, you're out of the quote unquote fat burning zone. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, um, it's true. You know, uh, the more intense the exercise, the greater reliance on carbohydrate during the bout, but in recovery, it can switch. And so there is evidence to show that short, hard bursts of exercise, interval training, very vigorous interval training. Yes, you're utilizing more carbohydrate during the interval sessions, but again, you get this switch into recovery and you can see greater fat burning during recovery. So I, we need to think about it as the whole, because you know people will say, well, how can doing a few short sprints result in any calorie burning at all? Well, again, it comes back to this recovery period and the afterburn effect. So I think you need about to think about 24 hour periods and not just what's happening in the exercise session itself. Yeah. And then what about exercising fasted versus fed? Uh, what's your take on the literature there? I guess in general and specifically as it applies to interval training. I would support that exercising in the fasted state, exercising after an overnight fast compared to a full breakfast is going to result in some greater calorie burning from fat or lipid. Maybe that can add up over time and potentially have some beneficial effects. If you're not a morning person or you don't like to exercise on an empty stomach, the message is meaningless to you. And so I think the greater thing is that people find what works for them in terms of when they like to exercise, what satiety level they want. Uh, and because that's going to promote greater adherence, I think, over the long term. But I would agree with the assertion that exercising in the fasted state will tend to result in a few greater grams of fat being burned uh, during the exercise session. But again, I think it's important that we don't overstate it. Yeah, and I think I think I, I like that we're coming back to this statement of yours that we we shouldn't overstate it. Whether it's the afterburn effect, the fat burning effect, the the difference between fed versus fasted. Yes, science says there's a difference between those, but then we have to talk about the magnitude of the difference. And I, from what I'm getting from you, the magnitude of difference is kind of eh. It's kind of not that impressive. So what really you have to do is what you're going to be most consistent with and what you enjoy the most. Is that a fair characterization? Definitely for the, yeah, again, we're using this hypothetical average individual, but you know, the <laughs> who's using exercise to, you know, try and boost their fitness level, you know, for them, I think it's getting the fundamentals down, right? Are you, are, you know, are, are you getting your sleep right? Are, you know, is your diet generally okay? Uh, otherwise we're, we're playing on the margin here with these things. But now if you're the elite athlete, and you're doing everything else perfectly, it's a bit like supplements, right? Some of the, you know, once you're doing everything perfect, it's like the tip of the pyramid, then it can have some subtle but highly beneficial effects. But if the base of the pyramid is not right, it's 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 within the noise, right? You right. It's it's meaningless for for most people if if you don't have the fundamentals down. Right. If you're still eating all the processed, highly refined carbs and junk food, but you're taking the supplements to improve your longevity, you're kind of missing the boat. So 
similar with exercise. All right. Well, but now say somebody has started on the interval training path to improve their health. And as they're doing it, they enjoy it. They're doing more of it. They're doing it, you know, five days a week. They're cranking it. They really like it. What can, what do you use as a gauge to say, okay, maybe you're doing too much and now it's time to pull the reins and and pull back a little bit. What do you use to gauge that? Again, I, I looked at some clues from highly trained individuals. And so even, you know, again, clearly I'm a proponent of interval training. I'm not an exercise physiologist who's uh, at the coal face with elite athletes. So I'm not working with elite athletes every day. But if you talk to elite coaches and elite endurance athletes, most are still using about an 80-20 split. So 80% traditional, modern intensity, aerobic base style training, high intensity slash interval training. And so I think the more your training starts to reflect the way that serious high level athletes train in terms of overall volume, in terms of structuring there, I think you need to be careful about the potential to do too much interval training. You know, if you're an elite athlete training 30, 40 hours a week, 20% intervals, that's a lot of interval training in an absolute sense, you know, five, six, seven hours a week. If you're only training five hours a week, then I think the percentages can slide a lot more. You know, you can 50, 60, 70% intervals because it's a very efficient way of training. So I think to your point, the more serious you get about training, the longer or the greater the volume of training, I think that's where you need to be mindful of the potential for doing too much because, you know, overtraining is this nebulous concept. It's really hard to define objectively or at least monitor objectively. But I think you can overtrain either because of high volume, high intense yeah. combination of both. Do you find much value in things like heart rate variability or, you know, resting body temperature or resting heart rate in general? Like, do you find much value in those metrics? I think resting heart rate in particular can, can really offer a lot to athletes or, or just everyday individuals um, in terms of providing their own baseline. And so let's say whatever fitness tracker or ring or product you're using, once you start to establish and you, you know, you have a pretty good idea that your resting heart rate is say 60 beats per minute. Suddenly you wake up one morning and, you know, you look at your data and it's 65, you know, that's an index that something's maybe not right. Maybe your sleep's not right. Maybe overtrained a little bit the night before, you know, maybe you're, there's some underlying virus that's, that's there. So I, I do think that resting heart rate in particular can provide a pretty good metric of when, when it's okay to go for it or on those days in particular, when you might be better off just taking a pass and and not doing anything. I, I think there's huge potential in heart rate variability but I just don't think it's as well established, nor it it comes back to the tools. How how well can some of these trackers actually determine things? Um, But I I do think many of them are at least good at providing you with what your stable baseline is, even if it's not an entirely valid measure. They tend to be pretty reproducible. And so whether your true heart rate variability is 30 or 40, it doesn't matter so much as you know your own baseline, this particular method. And then if you're, if you find it changing, um, then that could be a potential sign that you're overtrained and need to back off if your baseline is changing. Yeah. And then what about glucose utilization, glucose monitoring? I mean, people frequently, you know, CGMs are so popular now and especially in the low carb community, people find their biggest, you know, glucose increase of the day is with their exercise, with their interval training, or even people who aren't low carb, they'll see, you know, a breakfast rise and then an exercise rise. And, you know, we're sort of programmed to think higher glucose equals bad. Is there something different about the glucose rise with interval training? First point is, you know, we've done some of the work with, uh, I'd say the more continuous uh, traditional glucose monitors, we're now uh, experimenting and hoping to conduct some studies with the flash glucose monitors are out there and are utilized more for healthy active individuals as opposed to type two diabetics. I do think they can potentially bring some value, but to go to your point, high glucose per se is not necessarily bad, even if it's even when it's transient, you know, clearly high glucose is all the time, uh, you know, that put you in the pre-diabetic or diabetic range. That's not good, clearly. But if you have normal glycemia, transient spikes are not necessarily a bad thing. Although I will say, 
surprisingly, we when we've utilized CGM, we don't see the spikes or excursions into hyperglycemia that you might otherwise expect. Uh, clearly, we do in some of the, the type 2 diabetes work that we've done. But some of the, the as I say, these, these excursions are not as high as you might otherwise uh, think. But, you know, bottom line, like anything else, for the athlete or the everyday individual who is interested, some people really like data, right? It resonates with them. They can use it to be a, a, a tool. Maybe you can start to see, you know what, my glucose is, during your event are going down. Um, you're going to, you know, your flash glucose monitor is going to put you on to that before uh, you bonk or before <laughs> show that. So I think yeah. for some athletes, it can provide a tool that's going to help them perform at their best. Uh, but for others, you know, not everyone, not everyone wears a Fitbit or use, utilizes some sort of fitness tracker. Uh, some just, you know, go, go by feel. So it, again, I, I think what we're coming back to a lot in our conversation is it, it, it really depends on the individual and what they want to achieve. Yeah. And I think the other important part about the glucose is what's happening with insulin. I mean, if you're perfectly insulin sensitive, if your muscles are soaking up the glucose and it, it goes up and your insulin's not spiking, and then it comes right back down. And then what happens the rest of the day? So, I mean, is there, seems like there's evidence out there that glucose may go up with exercise, but then your 24 hour under the curve glucose actually goes down. And I, I might be mistaken, but haven't you done some of that recently? Research? Yeah, so definitely, right? You know, we've measured insulin sensitivity different ways. There's, there's, you know, various uh, metrics to do that. But yeah, you know, ultimately, I think we're just coming back to various indices of metabolic flexibility. And you're, you know, you're, you're right. You know that uh, uh, it, it, that relationship between glucose and insulin is obviously quite, quite crucial. Uh, and, and you know, I, I do think there, um, individuals sometimes a little bit of knowledge can be the dangerous thing, right? And <laughs> so I think we need to keep that in context uh, and, and people really need to understand uh, both their own values and, and what, they, uh, what they really mean. So again, it comes back to, uh, it can be a tool that's gonna help some individuals. Right, okay. Well, I, I think this has been a really good tour through the concept of inter interval training, the different types, the pros, the cons, the practical tips. I think we hit on, on a lot of different topics. Uh, anything else you think is important to mention for people who are thinking of maybe getting into interval training and want to know, is it right for them and, and how to do it appropriately? Yeah, I, I don't think so. You know, I, I, some of the things that we hit on, I think, apply. So start slow. There's definitely many different types of interval training. And so provide find a strategy that might work for you. Uh, and again, while I'm clearly a proponent of the approach, if you're otherwise hitting the physical activity guidelines through a more traditional way of doing things, that's completely fine. But I think for a lot of people, you tend, you know, when we look at the common barriers, yes, one is time, or at least that's a cited one. I think it's, it's an excuse for a lot of in, individuals, but clearly Boredom is another one. You know, this, this idea of variety, varying it up, I think that's where interval training really, really can shine, if you will, because there's so many different ways that you can do it. Uh, and if, if that allows people to sustain exercise over a longer period of time, that's great. Well, that concludes our little series on exercise. Like I said before, we did the, the previous episode uh, with Stuart Phillips talking about resistance training and muscle building. And now we've heard from two experts on aerobic training and on interval training. And, and hopefully you're getting the picture that the three of these are very related when it comes to health. Which one's right for you? Uh, it depends on a lot. It depends on what's your baseline fitness level. What are your goals and what's your baseline health level? But I think the key is that the, the concepts of building an aerobic base, getting a more time efficient workout with interval training, and building muscle and maintaining lean mass are three very important concepts that anybody can work into their life. The key is finding what works for you, right? Because if, if look, if, if going for an hour run is your thing and that's what you're going to do the most, then that's what you should do. And then you should try and look for other ways to build in some resistance training or little intervals while you're doing it. But if, if that sounds like the worst thing in the world and the most painful thing in the world for you, then you're not going to do it. And that's when maybe going for these 10, 20 minute walks to slowly build your aerobic base and doing some of these exercise snacks that Martin 
um, talked about in, in his book, The One Minute Workout, that he talks about. So maybe a- adding in some of those little higher intensity short bursts and then finding some way to just stress your muscles on a regular basis, even if it's not going to the gym. So you can see the key is finding a way to work for you because this three-legged stool of exercise with the aerobic base, the interval training, the resistance training, all independently contribute to your healthy weight loss and to your overall health. So the key is to do something, and if you can find a way to include all three legs of that stool, even better. So I hope this was a helpful little podcast section of exercise, both to give you the science behind it and the practical tips for how you can get started improving your life and your health. So thanks a lot for joining us, and we'll see you next time here on Diet Doctor Podcast.